We are, <clears throat> excuse me, going to get started here. Uh, my name is Barrett Hahn. I'm a member here at Peace, and uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening, Brady Cohn. Uh, Brady and I go back to college at Shattern State, which wasn't that long ago, but it, it seems it's it's a, it's a long time now. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so Brady graduated from Shattern State College, uh, as well as Shepherd's Theological Seminary, uh, and. His uh, missionary is uh, Calvary Ministries, and his mission is uh, to seek to equip the body of Christ to minister to people affected by sexuality issues, whether it is someone who is living in the LGBT community, a uh, person in the congregation who is struggling with same-sex attraction, or a family who is affected by a gay family member. The church needs to be equipped to walk alongside them, minister the gospel to them, and help them figure out what it looks like to walk with Christ in the midst of the struggle. Calibrate Ministries is starting a new conversation in churches, a conversation that focuses on the good news of Christ, making disciples, and redeeming sexuality in a world that has twisted and distorted it so badly. So, Brady Cohn. Thank you, Barry. Good evening, everyone. It's really good to be here with you all. So it's not very often I get to do talks just to parents, but I'm really excited when I do because uh, you guys are such an important group of people. And so I, I, you know, I, I deal with a lot of families whose kids are struggling, but many times the parents don't know until their kids are in college and start to make some different decisions. And you know, I always think, man, how could this story have been different if the parents had been equipped 10 years ago to, to really minister their child's heart in this area? And so I love being able to speak into parents. So how this is going to work tonight, I'm going to start with my testimony on what God's done in my life, and then uh, I'm going to share uh, some things along the way that God taught me about sexuality and, and from his word and then I'm going to share a few challenges for you guys as far as like just as how we can respond as Christians, a lot of the same things I share in a lot of churches, and then I'm going to hone in a little bit more on uh, how you guys can respond maybe as parents or some things as, as, as parents I think that you guys should know. And so we'll start out kind of very big picture, then I'll hone into our response as Christians, and then it will narrow down to uh, some, some tips for parents. And then we're going to do some Q&A. And so my number is up on the screen. And so we're going to do Q&A through texting. That way it is completely anonymous. Let's get real. No one wants to, you know, raise a hand and ask a question about sexuality in front of a group of people. So, so we'll do texting. And so uh, if, you don't, if you don't have a phone that's capable of texting, just go ahead and raise your hand during that time. And uh, Barrett will bring you the mic. But uh, most people, I'm assuming, can text them in. So... Uh, so yeah, so I'm excited to be here tonight. Uh, sexuality isn't something that we often hear about in the church. I don't believe that we hear about it often enough. Uh, it affects all of us in, in some way. It affects our families. It affects our kids. So I feel like it's a conversation we should be having. We need to be equipped to know how to respond in our own lives and to the world around us. I was thinking recently just uh, and, and kind of praying through just where our culture is at. And I think that we can get so frustrated with uh, what's happening in our culture, and we can get really confused by that, and I talk to a lot of parents who don't even know how to talk to their kids or what to say to their kids about sexuality. I came across a verse that I think is really fitting for where our culture is at and what it teaches. It comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. And I think that so much describes our culture and sometimes uh, some different churches that have been kind of led, a, led astray is that uh, they're so confident in what they think that they know, uh, but sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they, they've turned away from the truth, uh, but they're so confident in what they think that they know and what they're trying to teach. And I think that if you look at our culture, they say we're all about love. It's like that's really what the current movement is, is it's, it's all about love, is that all love is the same. It can never be wrong for two people to love one another. But our culture has no idea what it looks like to live this out where it says the goal of our command is the love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So our culture doesn't know what it looks like to love out of this good conscience that's been informed by God's word and a sincere faith that's really surrendered to Christ. 
and a pure heart that's been made clean and new by him. And so my prayer is that tonight I can maybe shed a little bit of light on what it looks like to, uh, uh, you know, walk in this culture with Christ in a, in a place where we're so confused on what we believe and how to walk alongside other people with a good conscience that's been informed by God's word. So with that said, let me open us in a word of prayer, and I will get started with my story. Dear Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for these people. I thank you for this congregation. They seem like such a just vibrant, energetic group of people. And so I just thank you that you've brought them to this place, uh, to this body. I thank you for my opportunity to speak to them tonight. I pray that you'll use my story to show them a little more of your grace and who you are. And I pray that you'll use my story and the things I share to show them any conviction where they may need it, to show them grace where they need that too. I pray that this community can move forward in loving their kids well and loving each other well and walking along beside people who are wrestling with these things. Pray these things in your name. Amen. So my story began a few decades ago. Uh, it's crazy that I'm getting kind of old, uh, but Barrett's getting old too, so I guess that's the game we play these days. Uh, and so my story began several decades ago. I grew up on a farm here in Nebraska, not that far from here, about 100 miles from here in the Sand Hills, kind of middle of nowhere. Ne Grand Island was actually the big city. We came to like twice a year to do all of our shopping and stock up on all the household goods. So I have fond memories of that. But I grew up in a, so this very rural place. I grew up in a small town where everyone knows everyone. And we're a Christian family, so you know, we did all the good things that a good Christian small town family does. You go to church on Sundays, you pray before your, your meals, you kind of put on this image that like we're this really great Christian family, we're doing all the right things. And but it wasn't always perfect inside like as no family is. But I grew up knowing that I was a sinner and needed Jesus and I'm very thankful for that background. But from a young age, I always remember feeling different than the rest of the boys. I remember looking at my dad, my older brother, and thinking there's something different about them. There's something that makes them who they are that I, I, I don't have. I just feel uh, different than them. I don't fit in. I felt much safer and easier to relate to my mom and my older sisters. But it wouldn't be until years later when I'd figure out what that difference was. Well, my life got pretty messy when I turned 11, and shortly after that, my parents got a divorce. So many of you guys have dealt with those situations. You know how difficult that can be. Well, my parents went through the whole divorce process, you know, of kind of fighting over each other's stuff, and finally had a court date where it was finalized. And we thought, thank goodness, finally we can just move on with our lives because it will be over with and done. But instead, my parents actually got back together 17 times. And so 17 times, literally, my dad moved back in with us, and every time it didn't work out. And so that was three years of just mass instability, three years of month to month not knowing if my parents were going to be together, which parent I'd be living with, where we were going to be living. And age 11 to 14 is just a really informative time in a person's life. And so I came through that time just feeling very chaotic and confused. It's also during the beginning of that time, but about the age of 11, where I started to discover maybe some things that were different about me, or some things started to develop in my heart. You know, age 11, you're going into middle school, which is like the worst time for everyone. It's awkward and difficult and confusing, all these changes happening. All of my friends started notice girls in ways that they had never noticed girls before. You know, girls went from having cooties to being kind of cute. There's that type of transformation happening. But I wasn't feeling those things for other girls. Instead, I started to have those same feelings for other guys. And I was really confused by that. I, I didn't know what to do with those feelings. I didn't know why I was having the, this just emotional and physical attraction towards other guys. I'd grown up enough in the church to know that homosexuality is a sin. But I grew up in some kind of very legalistic, uh, rural, conservative uh, type churches where that was the one unforgivable sin. And so just the fact that I had these these feelings filled me with shame and guilt. And so, as any sin issue does, as any desire does, when you just keep it a secret and you let it go, it just kind of grows and festers and, and, and starts to build in your heart. And so that's what these feelings did. By the time I was 13, I felt like they were just really consuming me, and I wanted an outlet for them. 
And at this time, my family had really walked away from the church, walked away from Christianity. But I kept going to youth group on Wednesday nights because deep down, I really wanted to know who God was, and I wanted to serve him and please him. So I was showing up to youth group on Wednesday nights, even though the rest of my family wasn't going to church at all. Well, I'd come to a point where I thought, maybe I should tell a youth pastor about what's going on in my life. Maybe I could tell them about these feelings. Maybe they'll have some answers. Well, one night at youth group, before I had the courage to do that, was a moment that forever changed my life. I'll never forget sitting there as just a very confused, hurting 13-year-old. When the youth pastor made the comment from the pulpit, he said, I wish all homosexuals would die. And that moment just felt like a knife to my chest. I'll never forget sitting there with about 30 other kids, and what was going through my mind was, wow, he's talking about me when he says that, that that's me who he's talking about. And so I actually went home that night, and I loaded a gun, and I was going to end my life. Because what was going through my mind was, if it's God's will for all homosexuals to die, then I, I guess I will. I'll just end it right now. Thankfully, right before I pushed the trigger on the gun, I heard my mom walk in the front door. And so I heard him put the gun away, and obviously didn't end my life that night. But that was just the start of a downward spiral in my life. That was the moment I put up a wall and said, I guess I can't let anyone in. I can't let anyone see what's going on inside of me. I have to keep it all secret. That was also the moment that I started to develop just a very deep distrust towards Christians and towards the God that they served. And so it wouldn't be until years later when I'd go back to church again. In the meantime, you know, I was a teenager walking through life with these feelings and attractions and the, the struggle. I was really confused, but it was soon after that that I discovered online pornography for the first time. And 20 years ago, when I was 13, that was a really new thing in our culture. The internet was a new thing. And so, but, but I discovered it and I was instantly hooked. And now, as we, we all know, that that's such a rampant thing in our culture that it affects so many men and women. But I was instantly hooked on to this pornography I found online. And for me, being addicted to this pornography was more than just a sexual addiction. It felt like this is the only place I can go where I can belong. This is the only place where people have the same feelings as me. And it was in this online world of darkness, but I so badly wanted to belong somewhere and to be understood. And that's where I found it. Well, just like most pornography addictions do, they grow over excuse me, they grow over time and they start to uh, go, it goes from, you know, thought life to fantasy and progresses to you want to start acting on these things, you want to experience it for yourself. And so when I was 14, I started to experiment with same-sex relationships and same-sex uh, sexual encounters, uh, sometimes other boys my age, sometimes much older men. Uh, and, and I just desperately wanted that. I remember waking up some mornings feeling like I just have to fulfill these desires somehow. And so I'd find ways to do that. And in the moment, it always felt so good. Like, this is what I've been longing for. This is what my heart's been craving so badly. Well, going through the rest of high school, I was really wrestling with a lot of questions. I was wrestling with things like, what does this mean for my life? What does this mean for who I am? Can I ever be married? Can I ever, you know, have a wife and kids? Uh, who am I? At that time in our culture, this issue was starting to be talked about a lot more, and what the media was saying, what everyone was saying, that if you're same-sex attracted, you're just gay, and that's who you are, and that's who you have to be, and that's how you should identify, and uh, you need to accept that to be happy. Well, I was also really wrestling with God, and I was asking God, because I, I'd grown up knowing God's Word, and uh, I was asking God questions like, all right, God, how could a loving God create me in a way that's going to condemn me to hell? Because it feels like I'm created this way. It feels like this is just who I am. And so if I'm going to hell for this, then how could a loving God make me in that way? And it felt like my spiritual life was kind of this pendulum of emotions swinging back and forth. And so on one end, I'd say, all right, God, I believe that you think that this is wrong. So I'm just going to fix myself for you to love me. I have to change myself. I have to fix myself. And so I tried to do that. I'd walk away from the pornography, from the sexual encounters, from same-sex relationships. I'd completely walk away from it all and just pretend like it wasn't there. Well, any of you who have ever been caught up in some type of addiction or lifestyle they didn't really want to be in, you know how that goes. It usually on average lasted about 42 to 46 minutes, I would say. 
and then I'd be back into pornography again, and so then you just give up. Just like anyone who's addicted to anything, you just give up and say, I, I guess I can't do it. And so then the pendulum would swing in the opposite direction, uh, where I'd be angry and bitter towards God, and I'd say, all right, I guess God just can't love me. So that's really where I was when I graduated from high school. I just accepted that this is who I am, this is who I have to be. Society says that I just have to live as gay, and that's the only choice I have. And I guess that feels right, because I've tried to be different, and I can't. So I guess this is just who I am. Well, I went to college, a small college here in Nebraska, Shadron State. Uh, I mean, you guys are probably familiar with it. And I, I went to this small college in Nebraska uh, to do their pre-med program because, you know, I really wanted to be a doctor to kind of prove to people how, how smart I was and had kind of a lot of idolatry and image issues going on there. Well, I'll never forget pulling up to Shadron State for the first time uh, to unload the, my, excuse me, to unload my car into the dorm rooms. And there's this group of guys standing there and they offered to help me unload my stuff. And so I was like, oh yeah, sure. It was kind of a typical college move-in outreach that, uh, that churches always do on college campuses. And so they helped me unload my stuff and then they invited me to a ministry on campus that I met on Wednesday nights. And so I went that first Wednesday night and you know, it was a, it was a great ministry. I, I wasn't walking with the Lord at all, but I thought that, oh, maybe this is a good place to make some friends. Uh, maybe I'll meet some of the right people here. And I still kind of had the Christian image thing going on. I wanted people to think I was a good Christian person. So maybe that'll give me the image that, uh, that I'm this good Christian person by showing up to this ministry. So I went on the first Wednesday night, and it was great. They had a band. They had a you know, speaker. I'm sure he shared the gospel. And I faithfully went to that ministry every Wednesday night for the next two years. And nothing I really heard from the pulpit really changed my life, because every time I heard the gospel, every time I heard about God's grace, I thought, ah, oh, that's not for me. God doesn't love me the way that I am. And so I just kind of dismissed that, and I was just so hard-hearted against God that I didn't believe that God could love me. But I kept going back to this ministry, not because of the words I heard there, but because of the community that was there. There were all these upperclassmen guys who just started to really pursue me spiritually. They started to include me in their community. They started to give me a different place where I could belong. They started to show me the love of Christ in just radical ways. One time, one of the guys, Brandon, changed the starter of my car in the middle of the night in the dorm parking lot so I could get home the next day. And I hadn't really realized over these two years how God was using them to soften my heart. How God was show, using me, excuse me, using them to show me who he was. These weren't just guys who did the religious thing that I grew up with of go to church on Sunday, go through the motions, check it off your list, put on a mask and pretend like everything's perfect. They're authentic and they're real and they're honest about what's going on in their life. But they weren't just authentic for the sake of authenticity. They were authentic for the sake of repentance. And because of that, I could see Jesus changing them from the inside out. And so God had been using them to show me a whole different picture of Christianity than I'd ever experienced. Well, I came to a place after my sophomore year where I was just really depressed. I had I'd gotten more and more involved in the LGBT community, and for a while it felt great. It, for a while it felt like this place where I can belong, where I'm understood. But it kept disappointing me. It kept uh, not fulfilling me in the ways that I thought it should fulfill me. And I remember walking away from sexual encounters, from same-sex relationships, thinking this isn't doing for my soul what it's supposed to do for my soul. This isn't making me feel loved the way that it promised to make me feel loved. And deep down, I know that I had some biblical truth in me still nagging me that this isn't what God intended, but I have no choice. But here for the first time, it felt like my sin was failing me. Up until this point, I thought, if I just have more of it, if I just have more of it, if it's in the right place, in the right context, if it's the right relationship, I'll finally be satisfied. But my sin was failing me like all sin does eventually. But I put all the chips on the table of living that life. I put all my hope into that life will make me happy. If I just accept who I am in that and become a part of that community— I'll, I'll finally be happy. I'll be fulfilled. But that wasn't happening. And so now I came to a place where I felt hopeless because that's where I put my hope. And now it was failing me. It was gone. It wasn't doing it for me. 
So I didn't know where to go from there. And I was at a place where I was really contemplating suicide again because I was so depressed about this. But I decided before I end my life, I know this, this was the grace of God, that before I end my life, I want to tell my Christian community about this life I'm living. Because I'd done a really good job of living a double life. Back then, the LGBT community was much more underground than it is today. So I'd done a really good job of keeping it a secret from them, even though it turns out they knew a lot more than I thought that they did, uh, like a lot of friends do. Uh, but I, I thought that they didn't know about any of this, and really me telling some of my Christian friends was going to be affirmation that they don't actually love me. They love the person they think I am. They love this image I've portrayed to them. But if they knew what was going on in my heart, if they knew this life I was living, there's no way that they would love me. And so that's going to be the affirmation that I needed, that they don't even love me like they claim that they do. No one loves me. No one can fulfill what's going, what I'm desiring in my heart. So that was going to be the affirmation I needed, and I was going to end my life. And so I told my friend Lex about the life I was living. I'll never forget telling him we're in my stepdad's house, and I had a gun load in my room, and said, if he rejects me, that's just going to be the end of my life. I, I'm going to go back to my room, and that's going to be the affirmation I need that no one loves me. Well, I poured out my guts to Lex and kind of told him everything. And I'm still standing here today, so he obviously didn't reject me. But instead, I'll never forget this moment of when he came across the room, he gave me this big hug, said, hey man, I love you, and I have no idea what this is going to look like, but it's going to be okay, because God's grace is efficient, your sin is no better or worse than my sin, and we're going to get through this together. And that just blew my mind that a Christian of all people could love me so well, could, could embrace me, even knowing the deepest, darkest secrets of my heart. And so I thought that I had no other option for my life. But for the next three days, what kept going through my mind was, that can't be Lex who loves me. That has to be the Jesus I see in him who loves me. Because for two years, I'd been able to see Jesus at work in his life, changing him from the inside out. So I kept thinking, that that can't be him. That has to be this Jesus I see working in him who loves me. And so finally, for the first time, I became convinced that uh, Jesus still loves me. That I think that despite what's going on in my life, I think that God's grace is sufficient for me too. And so it felt like I came to this place where I had nothing left in life except for the love of Jesus. But that was all that I needed. And so because of that, because I was convinced the first time that Jesus, the, the God of the Bible, loves me, I fell to my knees in repentance towards Christ. It was June 21st, 2006, and that was the moment I truly believed that God stepped into my soul and rescued me for eternity. And you see, I'd always called myself a Christian. I'd a lot of times done the right Christian things. And I, I'd spent hours as a, as a teenager begging God just to take these feelings and struggles away, and God had never done that. But what I'd realized that summer was that my faith had always been just kind of my demands on God. It had been my terms and conditions. It was me telling God, all right, God, I'll follow you, but I expect you to instantly take these feelings away, instantly make me attractive to women, and I don't want to have to tell anyone, and this is my terms and conditions, my demands on you, which I realized that summer was really no faith at all. But I came to a place where I said, all right, God, I trust that you love me. I trust that you're real. I trust that you died for me. And that's enough. So I don't care what it takes. I don't care who I have to tell. I don't care what I have to do. I don't care what it costs me. I surrender everything to you. And that is the gospel that Jesus is calling us to. Surrendering to him, no matter what the cost, no matter who knows, no matter what we have to do, surrendering to him because his love is enough. So after that moment, my life started to change. I told a few more of the, the Christian guys in my community from Shadron State who had really been investing in me. And they responded with the same love and grace as Lex had. Uh, they, they gave me a community for the first time where I could just pour out my heart on what I'd been thinking, what I'd been feeling, everything I'd been going through. Those first few weeks were a lot of emotionally vomiting on them because I had a lot to share that had built up over 21 years. But these guys continued to love me. They continued to read scripture with me. They knew nothing about these issues, but they did know that God's word is sufficient. 
And so they started to read God's word with me, and I started to memorize some of it. And over the course of the summer, I started to fall in love with God's word and the Jesus I found in it. But I still had this dilemma going on because God didn't just flip a switch and take these feelings and attractions away. I was still having them. I was still just as attracted to men, it felt like. And so I was wrestling with questions of, well, if God's grace is enough, can't I just go on being gay and just maybe it'll be different now? Maybe if I have God as my ultimate satisfaction, maybe I can go on just living that life and it'll be okay. But as I combed through scripture, I kept seeing God's purpose for marriage and God's purpose for humanity and, and how he made us. And I couldn't find any justification for continuing to live that life. All I could find was blessing one man and one woman for a lifetime. And I kept coming across this passage just like in 1 Peter where it says, Be holy as I am holy. And I had the conviction, and I'm thankful that God gave me this conviction, that if my eternity rests in his words... If, if this is my hope for eternity, if this is the truth that's written by God and, and I'm to surrender to it, then I need to surrender to all of God's word. I can't just pick and choose uh, what I'm going to believe or what I'm going to surrender to. I need to surrender to all of it. Even when it doesn't make sense or even when I don't know what this is going to look like. And there's one passage that summer that gave me hope that I could live a different life. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There's two, excuse me, there's three verses here. And it feels like the first two I heard over and over again growing up. Verses 9 and 10 say, Do not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor adul- excuse me, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. My life started to change when someone read me this third verse. The very next verse says, that's what some of you were, past tense. And I'd always heard those first two verses point out towards just the gay community. Kind of as like this self-righteous weapon against them of, hey, look at this, look at them. They're not inheriting the kingdom of God. When I really think that that list of sins covers most of us on a daily basis. But this gave me hope that I could live a different life when it says that's what some of you were, but you're washed and you're justified and you're sanctified. And so I, I read that and realized that this is not a new issue. This isn't a new thing in just our culture, but 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote this, there were people then who were homosexual and they're no longer that. Because they're washed and they're sanctified by the blood of Christ. And that gave me hope for the first time that I could live a different life. And so by the end of the summer, I completely walked away from sexual encounters with other men, from same-sex relationships, from the LGBT community. But at the end of the summer, my life looked so different. I was starting to get a grasp on my pornography addiction for the first time. But I do want to be very clear about one thing. I feel like for people like me, The goal of Christians so many times was for us to go from gay to straight. It seems like that's the goal that we have. We try to convince them that the way you're living is wrong. Uh, Be straight instead. But the transformation in my life that summer wasn't from gay to straight. It was from lost to saved. God stepped into my soul and he rescued me for eternity. And that's so much more remarkable than any type of just outward behavior change. And it was from that inward transformation of going from lost to saved that God started to remake me and remold me and change my heart. And that's how my behavior started to change. It's from that that my lifestyle started to change. So God didn't just flip a switch and take these feelings and attractions and desires away. But I want to share with you guys a few things that God did teach me that summer that helped me live a different life. The first was he gave me value. He showed me that my value doesn't come from other people. It doesn't come from romantic relationships. It doesn't come from getting this kind of romantic, emotional response from other people. It comes from Jesus because I am his. I'm made in his image. He created me, so my value comes from him. I can't earn it on this earth. I can't earn it from other people. Second is he gave me power. He showed me that now that I'm saved now that I know the Lord. It says, as a believer, I have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me. That means I have the power to wake up every day and choose to live a life that's 
in accordance to God's word, no matter what feelings and attractions and temptations I might have. And that is a power that I did not have as a non-believer. I feel like this is one area where Christians have a tendency to expect people to live a biblical life even if they don't know Christ, even if their life isn't surrendered to God's word. We try to convince them of just this morality of live this certain way, but if they don't yet know Christ, then their hearts are darkened to sin, and they're blind to sin, and so they don't have the power to do that. Thank you. That's perfect. I'm just getting over some throat issues, and so it's a miracle that I even have a voice tonight. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us that allows us to deny ourselves of the things that feel like they're so natural. The third thing is this. He gave me an eternal perspective. Let me unpack that a little bit. There's still moments in these last 13 years, um, actually there's been a lot of moments that have been a lot of struggle. There's been moments where it hasn't been easy. And we live in a culture, in a world that says that uh, living by God's standard for sexuality is not only impractical, but it's inhumane to expect anyone to do that. That's where the world tells us. It tells us we need these things, that our fulfillment comes from, from having them, and we should go after our heart's desire. Even though Jeremiah tells us that our hearts are deceitful, so uh, telling people to, you know, uh, that go after whatever their heart wants can be the worst advice we can give them. But back to my point. Uh, God gave me this eternal perspective where in these moments of struggle, these moments where it felt so difficult, where I don't know how I'm going to do this, I don't know how I'm going to go forward uh, uh, honoring God in this way. Uh, God always, always reminded me of, of a picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours before he's crucified. And Jesus is so tormented about what he's going to be going through on the cross. He's actually sweating drops of blood. And Jesus is tormented and excruciated knowing what he's going to be going through on the cross, not just because of the physical pain of, of suffering on the cross, but really the, the spiritual reality of taking on the sin of the world. But God always reminds me that Jesus did that. He still went there, and he did it. And he did it for me. He did it for my life. He gave his life for me. And one of my favorite verses is John 19.30, where Jesus speaks his last words on the cross. He says, it is finished. And I know that in doing so, in speaking those words, Jesus gave me everything I need for eternity, which is himself. So in light of the fact that I have everything I need for eternity— that makes my desires here on earth and what the world says that I need seem so foolish for these short years when I have everything I need for eternity, which is Christ. Lastly, he gave me a new identity. He showed me that I'm not defined by my feelings. I'm not defined by my attractions. I'm not defined by the label society gives me. I'm defined by him and him only because he made me in his image. I get asked a lot, why the sin of sexuality, especially homosexuality, is treated differently than so many other sins? Uh, why are, in our culture, are we forced to celebrate it uh, when we don't really celebrate other sins? And I somewhat disagree with that because I do believe we celebrate gluttony at potlucks every Sunday, uh, and that seems to be celebrated inside the church. And so I, you know, I do think there's other sins that we're really, really blind to that we celebrate without even knowing— However, uh, this does feel like it's different than other sins. I think part of it is it's so much about identity. It feels like this is who I am. Whereas so much other sinful behavior uh, is easy to distinguish behavior, even though there's a deceitful heart behind it. Uh, we can see other sins as behavior where this one feels like this is who I am. It feels like this is the way that God made me. But along the way, God, for these last 13 years, God started giving me a new identity. And as I grew in my relationship with Christ, my identity in Christ started to outweigh my identity in my sexuality. We live in a world that's so adamant that people who are gay are born that way. And that's just the way they are. And with every ounce of my being, I no longer believe that because I see my life change. I've seen hundreds, thousands of other people's lives changed by the gospel. I see that we were once that, but as it said in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, that's what you were, but you're no longer that. 
But sometimes our hearts are deceitful. And over time, God has started to show me what my heart had twisted. He started to show me this idolatry behind same-sex attraction, this idolatry of looking to other people to find my hope, to find my wholeness, to find my value. This idolatry of trying to acquire things from other people that they were never meant to give me. We see homosexuality in the Bible, one of the places in Romans 1. And so we see that, that passage referenced a lot when, when we talk about these issues. In Romans 1, it's this progression. It starts with, they trade God's truth for a lie. And because they trade God's truth for a lie, they started worshiping created things instead of the creator. They started worshiping images of God instead of God himself. And people are images of God because we're made in the image of God. So they started worshiping people instead of worshiping God. And this idolatry, this worship of other people gave them uh, sexual desires for those people. And so God gave them all of those desires, and they had uh, sexual relations with one another, including people of the same gender. But God took me down this reverse course of that, where through the power of the Holy Spirit, he helps us get control over the way we live our life. So with the power of the Holy Spirit, I started to change how I was living. But then over the course of time, over these last 13 years, through the sanctification that all of us uh, go through as Christians, this process of becoming more like Christ, God started to reveal some of the lies that I believed, lies about myself, about the world, about God himself. And every time God revealed the lies I believed, he could trade them for his truth. And every moment he did that, he gave me more and more freedom from these desires that once enslaved me. And now over the years, I've walked with hundreds of guys as, they, as they've dealt with that same idolatry, as they've left the gay lifestyle, as they've dealt with their same sex attraction. They started to understand that this is not natural or normal the way that it's supposed to be, but this is my heart twisting something and seeking something from someone that it shouldn't. But over the years, as God has shown me the idolatry of same sex attraction, like I said, this idolatry of uh, worshiping another person by trying to find my value and my hope and my wholeness from them. As he showed me this idolatry behind, you know, same-sex relationships and same-sex attraction, he's also showed me that there's that very same idolatry behind so many heterosexual relationships and marriages, not only outside the church, but inside the church. Really, this issue of homosexuality is really just a capstone on a culture that idolizes people, that turns to people for how they make us feel. And we're not new to that. This has been happening since the beginning of time. If you go back to Genesis, I, I'm not going to read the story. It's kind of spread out in a long story. But many of you guys know the story of Jacob, uh, clear back in Genesis. So Jacob's at a place where his life was a wreck. He, he made some bad decisions. He had family issues. I think we can all relate to that, bad decisions and family issues. And because of that, he had to flee his homeland. He had to, he had to flee where he was from. He comes to this place where he sees this beautiful woman. Her name is Rachel. And he's just infatuated with her. He has to be with her. And so he, he so desperately wants to have Rachel as his wife. He's willing to enslave himself for seven years to get Rachel as his wife. Well, if you know the story, he's then tricked into being with Rachel's sister Leah instead. But Leah isn't good enough. He only wants to be with Rachel. So he's willing to enslave himself for another seven years so he can have Rachel as his wife. And so Jacob's infatuation, his desire to be with Rachel, was this this godly, uh, kingdom-oriented mindset of, with our giftings, think about the work that God could do together with us. Think about uh, how God could use us together. Think about how our marriage of dying to ourselves, to love each other unconditionally, could be such a great picture of the gospel. Was that Jacob's heart behind pursuing Rachel? No, Jacob's life was a wreck, and he thought he could find redemption from a woman. He thought that being with this beautiful woman for, would provide him hope and wholeness. He thought he could find redemption in her. But there's no one who can give us redemption except for Jesus. And so we've been doing this from the beginning of time, of looking to other people for hope, for wholeness, to give us value, to give us redemption. And so if we're going to handle these issues of homosexuality well uh, inside the church and in our culture, um, we have to look at the bigger picture of marriage. 
because we've all twisted sexuality in some way. We've all turned to another person to find our value and our hope and our wholeness in ways that we shouldn't. Sometimes I, I talk to couples, and as you really dig into their life, it'll be a couple with inside the church that's been faithful to each other for 40 years, yet they spent those 40 years idolizing one another and placing a weight on one another that neither one was meant to bear. They're finding their hope and their value in one another, even though it should have been in Jesus. And so sometimes this idolatry can mask as... Uh, no, a, a great relationship, but at the heart, is still the same idolatry of turning to another person to find my hope and my wholeness. Continuing on with my story, uh, I went through most of my 20s growing my relation with Christ, really seeing God untwist some of the things that my heart had twisted when it came to sexuality, when it came to relationships, and untwist some of the things that had led to this idolatry and this same-sex attraction— I was doing some really great work in my life, but I'd come to a place where I really thought that I could never be married uh, because with this same-sex attraction that was still ongoing, that I was still dealing with at times, I thought with my past and this ongoing struggle, I'd just never be in a relationship with a woman. And I was content with that. I was content with my relationship with Christ, and that's a great place to be. I think that all single people need to be content in their relationship with Christ before they're ready for a relationship. And so I was content with singleness for the rest of my life. But as I was in seminary a few years ago, as I started to learn more about uh, God's purpose for marriage and how God builds healthy intimacy, intimacy that's built on deep knowledge of one another and trust of one another and reliance to one another and commitment to each other, and then intimacy follows those things, when, when intimacy is built on the right things, uh, the godly things that he calls us to in marriage— that started to open up my eyes that maybe that could be a possibility for my life. I was very hesitant about that because I, I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I want to be very careful not to place my hope in that. That I never wanted to put a woman in, my, in a place where she was bearing a load that she was never meant to bear because I'm trying to find my redemption in her. That God was opening my heart to the fact that uh, that could be a possibility for my life. Well, it's during the end of my, my seminary experience that one of my seminary classmates uh, sent me a message. It was like, hey, Brady, there's this really remarkable woman in uh, my church. Her name is Mary. Would you be interested in going on a blind date with her? And so I was like, oh, sure. Uh, why not? It won't hurt. I'd literally never been on a date with a woman. But I thought, I I'll go and just I'll see what the Lord does. And so it, it kind of it's kind of a funny story now. It wasn't so funny at the time, but I had this, I had this uh, blind date set up with Mary for the very next day. So I was in Nebraska. I was supposed to go out that evening uh, to Wyoming, go on a date with her. And that day, my house burned down, uh, literally. And this was in Kearney about three years ago. And uh, so I had to call Mary and say, can't go on a blind date. My house burned down today. And she's like, oh, yeah, sure. Great excuse. Uh, you couldn't come up with anything better than that. And uh, so I texted her some pictures, and she was like, oh my gosh, your house did burn down. I'm so sorry. And so it was about a month later, we went on our first blind date together. So, and she's now my wife. Uh, we just celebrated our first anniversary. So to say things are getting pretty serious. Uh, but as I was pursuing Mary, and, and we had kind of this a slow dating process. We both had a lot to unpack, with, especially with my background and kind of testing the waters and seeking lots of wise counsel in this. As I was dating her, I, I kept getting all these interesting responses from Christians. I kept having Christians say things like, oh, you're dating a woman, so you're attracted to women now. And I'd always cringe at that comment because I'd say, no, 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 because I don't, I don't want to be attracted to women, because I don't want to trade lust for men for lust for women, because they'll get me nowhere in the kingdom of heaven. I'd say, I want to be attracted to one woman, and that's my wife. And over the course of three years of dating, engagement, and now uh, a marriage, God has built that attraction between Mary and I based on these healthy biblical principles of commitment and reliance and trust and knowledge of each other in ways I've never experienced for another woman, nor do I ever want to experience for any other woman. The world says that 
my life is impossible, that stories like mine don't exist, that people who are that way just have to be that way, that's the way you are. If you're same sex attracted, you just have to be gay. That's who you are. But God has proven otherwise that through his word, through the gospel, he can change our lives. And not only the way that we live, but he can change our hearts. And so God's done a beautiful work with Mary and I. And uh, um, I, I never thought I'd be in a relationship with a woman, but God has, has done a remarkable work. But I'm not alone in this. There's, there's thousands of us, people that I know, who God has done miraculous work in our lives. And, and sometimes that doesn't result in marriage because we don't find a redemption through marriage. Sometimes that results in uh, satisfying singleness where Christ is all that we need. And our life as a single person is also a picture of the gospel. Just as Mary and I's relationship and our marriage can be a picture of the gospel the way that we love each other unconditionally. So that's what the Lord's done in my life. I want to give you guys, what time is it? It's 20 after, so we have about 40 minutes left. Um, I want to give you some few pointers here before I get to some questions. So if you haven't texted in a question, now is a good time to kind of pause and uh, think of some questions. It looks like there's a bunch that have come in, so I really appreciate that. Um, and so keep those coming, and uh, um, we will get to those shortly. So a few things that we as Christians can do to respond. I to these issues in our culture. How do we handle this? How do we make disciples? How do we be obedient to what Jesus has called us to do in a culture that is so confused about sexuality, where every time you bring it up, it's such a hot topic, where people get so emotional about it. So I have four challenges for how all of us as Christians can, uh, can make disciples in this culture with where we're at. So the first one is this. If we're going to make disciples, we have to be safe people and create safe environments. We have to do that by being very careful about what we say and how we say it. I was talking to a guy a while back in a church where I spoke, and he came up to me after the service and shared with me that he struggled with same-sex attraction. He was in his mid-30s, had struggled his entire life, you know, since, since puberty, and he had never told anyone. I was the very first person he had told. And as he shared more of his story, He's, that this issue had really just paralyzed him with shame and guilt and isolation because he didn't feel fully known by anyone in his life. And he'd been in the same small group Bible study, the same men's group for five years. And so I asked, like, why have you never told them about the struggle in your life? That's the first place we should start talking about this so we can get some help and encouragement and support. And he said that one of the very first weeks that they met, one of the guys in the small group made a comment about homosexuality. Another guy said, well, it's a good thing none of us struggle with that. And, you know, I have no doubt that those guys probably had no malicious intent behind those words, but they had no idea that someone in the room struggled with that. They had no idea that, that someone there was deeply affected and wrestling with those issues. And so the way that they talked about it instantly put up some walls and put up barriers. And this guy said, well, I guess this isn't a safe place. I guess this isn't a place where I can be real about what's going on in my heart. I guess this is a place where I have to put on a mask and pretend like it's okay. And so we have to talk about these issues with the assumption that someone in the room is affected by this. I think every church I've gone to— uh, and now it's becoming more and more prevalent that every church I go to, there's someone in the room that's deeply affected, either themselves struggling, their, their uh, child is struggling, their, their husband, wife is struggling. They're, they're deeply affected by these issues. The way that we talk about it is important. It's really living out Ephesians 4.29, where it says, make sure that everything you say gives grace to those who hear. So we can talk about these issues with truth and with the truth of God's word, but we have to do it in a way that gives grace to those who hear. The second is this. We need to practice what we preach. Let me unpack that a little bit. I, I already talked about this uh, earlier on a little bit more than I normally do. So I'll make this one short, but we have to practice what we preach because, like I said, sometimes the very same idolatry I see behind same-sex attraction of looking to another person for my hope and my wholeness and my value is the same idolatry we build marriage on outside the church and inside the church. And the world out there is never going to buy into the message we have for them of the gospel unless they see us undergo the same transformation we're calling them to. 
I still go to a lot of churches in rural areas where sometimes the attitude is, oh, look at that gay community. They're ruining the sanctity of marriage. And my response is always, I think that heterosexuals have done a pretty good job of that over the last hundred years. Through no-fault divorce, cohabitation, all kinds of sex outside of marriage, pornography, we've done a pretty good job of trampling on the sanctity of marriage. And so our response to the world out there starts with us. We need to look at our own life. We need to look at our own marriages and ask, how have we twisted what God made good? What standard do we have for marriage and sexuality in my own life? One day I was at a church, uh, and it was actually my church I was going to at Laramie while I was in seminary there. And I overheard this group of college guys talking. I was kind of listening in on their conversation and, uh, you know, pretending like I wasn't, but I was. And I was hearing them talk about girls, and they're kind of talking about, hey, like, maybe you should date this girl, or maybe this girl's a, 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 an option for you. And, as I was listening, they, they brought up this certain girl, and the guy was like, uh, I don't think so. She's only a seven, and I'm holding out for an eight. And I really wanted to say, well, you're only a two, so uh, let's do some math here and see, see how that works itself out. But thankfully, I was filled with the Spirit of the Lord that day, and I, I held my tongue, and I didn't say that. But that was just such a picture of how we've bought into this idolatry in relationships. And I see that uh, in the church and in our culture, uh, relationships don't look that much different. We pursue people based on two reasons. Who were the most sexually attracted to, even though sometimes those attractions were based on so much unhealth and unholiness and lustful desire. And two is who makes us happy, who gives us these feelings of happiness. And so it's no wonder that the LGBT community wants to have the right to marry whoever will make them happy and whoever they're the most sexually attracted to because that's what we've turned marriage into. Instead of this covenant that's unconditional of dying to ourselves to love someone no matter how well they love us, which is what God calls us to do. So our response to our culture always starts in here by evaluating our own sexuality and our own relationships. The third thing is this. Uh, we need to judge rightly. So let me unpack that a little bit. I, I feel like when I was a child growing up in, in you know, the U.S., the cultural verse that everyone knew, kind of the cultural verse we all clung to, was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Like, we all knew that verse. We all wanted to believe that God is love, and we believe that. And whether you're a believer or not, it, it seems like you knew that verse. And I think right now our cultural verse comes from Matthew 7, 1. But not the whole verse, just the two words, judge not. And so we live in a culture that says, oh, well, God says not to judge. Uh, you can't judge what I do. Uh, that, that's not your place. God is about non-judgment. It's no one's place to judge. But when we look in the full context of the verse, it says, uh, judge not lest you be judged. And it's telling people not to hold others to a standard they're not holding themselves. And so God is telling us to not to judge. He's telling us to not judge as hypocrites, which we've done as the church, as the body of Christ, way too many times in the past. We've looked at the, the LGBT community. We've caused some serious pain and hurt uh, by judging them when our own uh, lives were a wreck, when our own marriages were based on some of the same idolatry. But God doesn't just say, well, just don't judge one another. He says to judge rightly. We, we serve a God who judges things. He looks at things and says, this is good. This is not good. This is very good. And as people made in his image, he calls us to use that same discernment to measure things according to his word and be able to look at our culture in our lives and say, this is good. This is not good. But our judgment that, that uh, seeing sin in other people's lives in our culture, that judgment of this is not good should always come from an attitude of humility and sorrow. An attitude of humility, knowing that we are just as undeserving of God's grace. And sorrow uh, from the fact that this person has not yet discovered the grace to be freed from this. And so too many times the church, the church has judged self-righteously. And the answer isn't to not judge at all. The answer is to judge rightly with an attitude of humility and sorrow and not holding people to a standard that we don't hold ourselves. The last is this, enter the mess. Sometimes in the church world, we want to keep things clean and sterile, 
But that's not how we make disciples because people's lives are messy. Our own lives are messy. And if we're going to apply the gospel to people's lives, we have to be willing to enter the mess of their lives. One day when I spoke at a church, I had a lady come up to me afterwards and said, yeah, I really should reach out to my lesbian neighbors, but that sin is just too yucky for me. And I had two responses for her. First, I said, go home and look at yourself in the mirror and understand that Jesus had to hang on the cross just as long for your sin as he did for your lesbian neighbors. And secondly, go read Acts 17. It talks about where Paul goes to Athens. And when Paul gets to Athens, he sees a city that's so full of idolatry and sin, including sexual sin and homosexuality, he's physically sickened by it. But did Paul say, that sin is just too yucky for me? I'm going to keep myself at a distance? No, he went there and he lived with them so he could get close to them. And he said so that he could understand the idols that their hearts were serving. So that he could apply the truth of the gospel to them. So if we're going to make disciples in this culture, we have to be willing to enter the mess of people's lives. We have to be willing to get close enough to them so we can see the idols that their hearts are serving. Because their lifestyle is just the outward behavior of deeper hard level issues. So we have to be willing to enter the mess of people's lives because just as with Paul, uh, his discomfort was worth it for the sake of the gospel. And getting messy in people's lives, engaging in messy hearts, sinful hearts, is worth it for the sake of the gospel because that's how we understand the idols their hearts are serving. I want to end with a few pointers towards the parents here, which I think is all of you. Um, there's a few that I'm suspecting are grandparents. I'm not going to point you out, but uh, um, I'm very glad that you're here too. Um, and so I want to leave you with a few things specifically for parents. I have like eight things here, but I really want to leave some time for Q&A, so I might skip over a couple of them. Uh, how do we disciple our kids in this culture? How do we walk our kids through this in a culture that's so confusing? They're, they're being bombarded with messages in every way. Uh, I, I think that one of the principles I've had to bring up, so this is my first point on how we walk our kids through this, one of the principles I've had to bring up to a lot of parents uh, as I've walked them through their kids who are struggling with sexuality issues is that the greatest threat to your child's life is not the world out there, it's the sin that's within. Because I, I deal with a lot of parents who are, their child goes to college and then they come out of the closet as gay and say that this is just the way I am. And the, the parents are like, how did this happen? I protected them from the world. I protected them from all the things in our culture. And I have to tell them that the problem, their greatest threat is not the culture. Their greatest threat is their own heart. James 1.14 says that we're enticed by sin, by the evil that's within our own heart. So yes, we protect our kids from the world. We, we need to be conscious of what they're viewing, of what they're watching, of what's influencing them. But we also need to engage with their heart and disciple their heart because it's their own heart that will lead them to sin. And so their greatest threat to their children and to your children and to your grandchildren is not the world out there. It's their own heart because their own heart is deceitful and bent towards sin. And so we need to disciple their hearts, engage with their hearts as we protect them from the world. The second is this. Uh, these conversations should be just a part of regular discipleship. We need to, as, as parents, help them process through the things that their hearts are feeling, the emotions they're having, the attractions that they're having. That's part of discipleship. That's part of discipleship of our kids. I feel like I deal with a lot of parents who, uh, it's like, yeah, I talked to my kid about the birds and the bees once. I told him everything he needs to know. It's like, but this is such a big part of our heart. It requires constant discipleship from a young age on what's God's standard for relationships. How are you responding to other people? How are, how's your heart feeling things? And what is it feeling? And what does that uh, reveal about what you're believing? Those are questions we help guide through our kids through from a young age because that's how we disciple them. We should have the first word on what influences our kids in these areas, not the world out there. It comes through discipling our kids from a young age, having regular conversations about what relationships and marriages are supposed to look like. And as they go through puberty, we should be talking to them about the things that they're feeling, the desires they're having. 
and helping them discern whether or not the desires they're having are good or not good or very good. That's part of discipleship of our kids. The next thing is this. We teach our kids God's purposes and the beauty and design for marriage. Uh, I feel like for too long, we lived in a culture that kind of somewhat had Christian values. So we kind of entrusted our kids to the culture and we let the culture raise them. Because we thought, well, if the culture raises them, they have some sense of Christian morality, and we're good enough with that. So we didn't actually disciple our kids to love Jesus and disciple them in God's word. We just let culture raise them. And one day when I gave a talk kind of like this to a group of parents, I, I had a parent ask the question, uh, there was, this was a couple of years ago, and there was a Disney movie coming out. I think it was Beauty and the Beast. And the question was that there's new Disney movies coming out that kind of insinuates that a character is gay. And so it said, should we not allow our kids to watch Disney movies anymore? And my response was, since when have Disney movies been the standard for relationships? It's like, Disney movies should not have been the standard for relationships long before there's one gay, possibly gay character. It's like, it's always about this idolatry of, uh, I have this great need, and this person comes along and rescues me. And they never should have been our standard for relationships, but it seemed like parents were okay with that as long as it was heterosexual, as long as it was straight. But all of a sudden, one gay character, and we're questioning about whether Disney movies should be the standard when they never should have been the standard. And so our kids can't gain their knowledge of relationships and marriage from culture. It needs to be from us. Next is this. Your parents need to, excuse me, your kids need to be prepared for the world they're growing up in, not the world you grew up in. And I think that uh, that can be a big but powerful thing for parents to process through because as I talk about uh, how parents are discipling their kids and you know when when parents have a kid who's a child who's struggling uh we, and we're kind of unpacking how did it get to this point and I, I see a lot of parents kind of uh um raising their kids in the world that they grew up in assuming that it's the same but it's not the same and so that's not necessarily good or bad but it's just reality that it's a different world. They're being told different messages. And so we need to process through their hearts what they're being taught by culture now, not what culture was teaching 30 years ago. Next thing is this. God's word is the standard, not our own fantasies, desires, experiences, or ideals. Children, you need to understand that marriage is, isn't what we think it should be. Marriage is what God says it is. And I... Uh, um, I, I see a lot of parents where uh, they have this ideal, what, mar what they think the marriage should be, whether they've experienced that or not. And so they try to push that ideal onto their kids as this is what marriage should be, even though it still does not line up with God's word and the, the bigger vision that God has uh, for, for marriage. Um, next point is, if we're going to have a biblical view of marriage, we have a biblical view of singleness. Uh, I think that one of the, when I get together with parents whose kids are struggling with sexuality, uh, one of the things that um, I see come out is that a mother's worst nightmare is that my child would never get married and give me grandkids. Or it's this attitude of, well, if he just found the right woman, I think he'd be okay. It's like, no, because redemption is not found in a woman. Redemption is found in Christ. And so I, I see sometimes parents pushing their kids towards marriage because they think that this woman will finally straighten him out. It's like, no, the person who needs to straighten him out is Christ. And he needs to be straightened out at least somewhat before he's in a place to be in a relationship with a woman, in a healthy way anyway. And so we have to have a biblical view of singleness. And if a child has same-sex attraction, and that means that uh, and they want to surrender to God's word, and they want to be obedient to God, and maybe they'll mean a lifetime of singleness. Not all of us are called to marriage, and Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 7 that singleness can be a good thing. We need to embrace that as a church. But uh, 
many times this attitude comes from the fact that we put our hope in marriage. You know, people put their child's hope in marriage and think that if they can just find the right spouse, they'll be okay. But it's only Jesus who will make them okay. The last thing I want to leave you with this is this. Is that as parents, you can have peace knowing that God is in control. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace, and be thankful. So I truly want you guys to leave here being thankful that we serve a God that is so much bigger than our kids' issues, than our issues, than our parenting issues, that we are never going to be perfect as parents. That we're never going to have it all together where you guys have made mistakes and you'll continue to make mistakes. And God isn't asking you to be a perfect parent because he is in control. But he does want to, you to model to your kids what repentance looks like, what pursuing God looks like. And when we do that, we show our kids who Jesus is. When we love them with the love of Christ, we show them that, uh, that marriage is so much bigger than ourselves, that, that everything in this world is so much bigger than what culture says but that God is in control. And so I want you guys to leave here with a sense of peace that you can't fix your kids, and that's a good thing because only Christ can do that. And so be a picture of Christ to them and trust them to him and disciple them well, and then you can have peace knowing that he is in control. Um, Let me just... uh, Before we get on questions, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Let me just close this time in a word of prayer. I feel like I just like spewed out so many things to you in the last hour. That was so much to take in. And so let me just close us in prayer and we can gather our thoughts. And then I do want to engage first in a few questions uh, before um, we get going. And so I know there's already been a lot of questions texted in. But then if uh, you don't have a phone capable of texting, feel free to uh, still raise your hand. But let me, let me pray for us. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you love us so well. We thank you that our redemption is found in you and only in you and not through a person. So therefore, we never have to put a person under that weight. I, I pray for the parents and the grandparents in this room that they can love their children well and that they can show their kids a heart that's pursuing Christ. We know that no parent here is ever going to be perfect. If there's parents here wrestling with any type of shame and guilt over choices that they made, I pray that they can find your grace, that they can walk out of here with peace, knowing that you love their kids way more than they ever could. And where the ideal is lacking, your grace is sufficient. So I pray that these are parents who can take steps towards you, that they can take steps towards their kids, that they can uh, engage with their kids' hearts, and through that, they can show their kids a heart that's for Christ. We pray for the rest of our time with some Q&A, that it can be fruitful and beneficial, and just uh, unpack some of these issues in in a different way. In your name, amen. This is always the exciting part. I love Q&A because you just never know what's going to be asked. Sometimes it's good, sometimes maybe not, but uh, we'll see. So here's a great question. Um, <clears throat> this says, how much of the current sexual orientation struggles and even gender confusion is approached as a fad related adolescent identity development? So that is a very big topic that uh, could take all night to unpack, and so we're, I don't think we're going to get there. Um, you know, uh, I think that there's some truth to that on some things being a fad. You know, I think that when I was growing up with this and uh, struggling with it, you know, and all the guys that I talked to with same-sex attraction, I've talked to hundreds, if not thousands, uh, the, the real, really same-sex attraction guys who were, leads them to gay identity and gay lifestyle, um, I don't think I've met any of them who didn't have those desires from puberty, and most of them at some point did not want them. We probably live in a culture now where there's probably a lot more people who have just been okay with those desires from the beginning, even though they never chose them because it's a lot more accepted. But I've never really met a guy who didn't really have those desires from the beginning. And, and it seems to work a little bit differently for men and women. It seems like for, for men, the feelings are, and attractions are much deeper when it comes to same-sex attraction and very physical-based. And with women, it's more emotional. I think, you know, that 
probably not a surprise to any of us. And so for guys, since puberty, they've had these desires. And so most guys I know too, I know with same-sex attraction, it's not really a fad. It's not something that's, that's cool, but it feels like this is who I am, and they've struggled with it for a long time. And I'd say there's a lot of girls who fall into that camp too. When it comes to girls, though, with same-sex attraction, uh, attraction seems to change a lot quicker, be a lot more fluid. I have met a lot more women who had never been attracted to uh, women before, never struggled with it, but they met one woman, and they formed this kind of emotionally enmeshed, uh, very codependent relationship with that woman, and then sexual desires formed from there, and they ended up in a relationship. And where I don't hear that story a lot from guys, I do hear that a lot from women, where it's much more fluid, and women who have never struggled with it start struggling with it because of an emotional connection with a certain woman. Uh, but with where our culture is gone, I think that there's a lot more with, so transgenderism and homosexuality are kind of different things, and so right now I'm unpacking the, the homosexual side of it, and that's where, you know, most of my experience is. With women and girls right now, I think that uh, we live in a culture where for middle school, high school age, it can be kind of the cool thing to do to be in a bisexual relationship or same-sex relationship. So I think we're seeing a lot more uh, people, especially girls, maybe some guys, but more so on the girl side where having a girlfriend is just kind of the cool thing to do and there's not any real deep attraction there or desires there. It hasn't really been a struggle, but it is just kind of the fad, the cool thing to do. Um, but I, I think that uh, when I meet someone with same-sex attraction, you know, I, I never assume that because most people I've met with same-sex attraction, it is a deep, difficult issue for them that's caused them a lot of pain that they've struggled with for a lot of time. And so I don't think we ever want to make the assumption, oh, you're just doing that or saying that to be cool. Uh, because for most of our culture, it was not the cool thing to do, and, and people killed themselves over it. People begged God to take these things away, and uh, people were rejected, you know, because of it, and people kicked out of their families. I, I said, oh, so many people have heartbreaking stories of, as a 16-year-old, they confessed their, you know, sexuality struggles with their parents. They were kicked out of their home, and so someone wouldn't go through that because it's cool, because it wasn't cool, and they, they, they paid dearly because of it. Uh, but I think that we are seeing some of that now. Uh, I think that then, as in our culture, the last three years, four years, five years, transgenderism has taken on a whole new life form. And I think that that's an area where just our culture is crazy and is, is buying into beliefs that are uh, not real and not even scientific. It's like, that is, if you want to talk about science deniers, it is some people who are buying into the transgender movement. And I've, uh, I've met with a lot of people uh, who now are former transgenders because they did the whole trans, the transition that uh, you know, society says they should do, and it did not do for them what it promised to do for them. It didn't bring them peace. And you know, one of the, uh, Johns Hopkins University, who pioneered uh, um, sex change transitioning and sex change surgeries has stopped doing them because the people who create these surgeries say, this is not cutting it. This is not doing it. This is not helping people the way they're supposed to help people. And so I think that a little bit of the secular world is starting to wake up to that. And we need to have compassion for people who are struggling with those things of, like, they didn't choose these struggles. This is uh, some deep-rooted confusion many times. It also breaks my heart, too, when we see sometimes little kids, in most cases, little kids who have any type of gender confusion, it's so temporary, where it's just this phase, if we just let them grow out of it, they grow out of it. But part of the problem is we live in a world that is, uh, that then so desperately wants them to embrace it. So one little sign of, of gender confusion, and they're labeled as transgender, kind of forced to go through this process which is just insanity. And as we should be questioning what these people are saying, and we shouldn't just go along with what society says is, is good. But we do it with, with compassion and love towards people, understanding that many of them have gone through deep, difficult struggles. Uh, but um, we live in a culture where it is 
the fad, cool thing to do to accept transgenderism and celebrate that. So it's almost like, you know, it's this child shows this, these, these hints of uh, gender confusion. And instead of just letting them work through it, uh, we, we force this on them because it's kind of the cool thing to do right now. I, one day I was talking to a, a parent who had a really good perspective on this and understood a lot of these issues. Um, and, uh, and they said that when dealing with their seven-year-old, their, their seven-year-old, I think, was a girl and uh, said, hey, mommy, I think that I'm actually a boy. I want to be a boy. And so uh, she didn't freak out. She just said, like, why is it that you think that? She said, well, th- uh, the boys are playing with this certain toy, and I really want to be able to play with that. And so she was able to say, oh, well, girls can play with that toy too. There's nothing wrong with that. And so, oh, okay, I guess I'm okay with being a girl. And, like, it was such an innocent, sweet little thing that was so easy to overcome. But we live in a world where if they'd said that at school or to a certain parent, that person would have grabbed hold of that. It's like, oh, really? Yeah, like, maybe you're meant to be a boy, and you should embrace that. And let's, like, start this whole process of transitioning. And it's just it's, it's insanity, and we need to question that. It's, it's great to question that. We should question that. We should judge whether this is good, this is not good, or this is very good. Like, use discernment like God's called us to do. And that's not to say that all people's struggles end easily. There's some people who've had years and decades of, of deep struggle and pain, and we should, we should uh, uh, be sensitive to that, have compassion towards that, but understand that ultimately healing comes from Christ, not from what our culture has to say. Okay, uh, there are several questions along the lines of, um, uh, do you think that like people are born gay, or they, are they born with those desires? So let me kind of um, try to answer that all in one shot. Uh, and we only have six minutes left, and that's about a 30-minute question. Uh, but, you know, I kind of already explained this of, uh, um, of this kind of idolatry I see behind same-sex attraction and of, the, you know, looking to another person for my hope or for my wholeness. And, and so, you know, I'm 100% you know, convinced that we're not born this way because I've seen what our hearts have twisted, and I've seen God untwist that in my own heart and so many other people's hearts. But with that said, you know, when I'm asked that question, uh, when we're having this in, in discussion, I, I think we need to um, have compassion and understanding that it feels like we're born that way. I know what that feels like. That it feels like this is just who I am. And that's people's experience. And so we know that their experience uh, does not lead them towards truth. But if they're not a believer especially, that's not an argument I'm willing to— uh, to to die on. That's not a hill I'm willing to die on for a couple of reasons. Because if they don't know the Lord, they don't have the Holy Spirit illuminating those areas of their heart. And so so I don't expect them to understand this from a biblical, godly, you know, deep perspective when they don't have Jesus inside them showing them that. So I think we have to be wise in who we have these conversations with on, on where we should care more about people than we care about winning an argument. And so I don't want us to just go out and have an argument with people on, hey, like, no, like, people aren't born that way. This guy at church said so. And even if we know some of the theology behind the heart, and uh, which I wish we could go way deeper into today, it's not an argument we're willing to die on. And, you know, there's, despite what some people in our culture say, there are no studies that, that show that people are born gay. There's just not. They, they try to claim so, but the people who, you know, because I've had debates at, like, big universities and, you know, uh, uh, things like that with, with all these academics, and I say, well, the studies that uh, um, show that people are born gay, and I'd say, what studies? And they never know what those studies are. They just assume that they exist. But there's all these studies done back in the 90s, like uh, the Simon McVeigh study and this twin study uh, that did not at all conclude that, that anyone is born gay or with same-sex attraction, but people have twisted certain statistics in those studies to try to claim that, even though the authors themselves say that that's not the case. Uh, and so nothing proves and shows that people are born gay, but I think that even if something did, even if, uh, I, I do think that there's certain personality traits that are more inclined to, uh, to struggle with certain sin issues. You know, my brother and I, we grew up in the same environment uh, with the same set of parents, the same small town, Nebraska. Um, he certainly doesn't struggle with this, but 
because he has a very different personality, so his heart responds in very different issues. So he has his own set of sin issues he struggles with. But certain people tend to respond different ways to certain circumstances, environments, and our hearts twist things in certain ways. So we might have personalities that are more inclined to be twisted in this way and give us this struggle, but that doesn't mean we're, we're born that way. And I'd also tell people that even if something proved that we're born with this attraction— we're all born into sin. We're all born with sinful hearts. That's why we need to be born again. We're, none of us were ever born right the first time. So I think in one way it doesn't matter because uh, whether we're, we're born, you know, with same-sex attraction or not, we're all called to deny ourselves and to submit to God's word, and there's peace and joy in that, and he gives us life in ways that the world never could through our obedience. And so in that way it doesn't matter. Uh, we all have sin struggles, and we're all called to obedience in Christ. But I think that the topic of are we born that way does matter when it comes to sanctification. Because for a Christian who's trying to walk with the Lord, uh, I, I want them to be able to go through this process where they allow the Lord to show them what their heart is twisted and, and what might be some of the lies that they believed. And I see some Christians go through this, you know, they come to the Lord, and, and I don't doubt their salvation that's between them and the Lord, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, I assume I'm my brothers in Christ, but they still identify as gay, and it's called celibate gay Christianity. And so they say, well, uh, I'm going to identify as gay, and I'm going to even maybe celebrate that part of my life, but uh, I'm not going to act on it because I believe that's sinful, but I, don't, I believe that I was probably just born this way, so I'm going to embrace these feelings, but I can't act on it. And I've seen that being a very dangerous road for them to go down because they're always keeping one foot in the door and they're always having to white knuckle it for the rest of their life, trying to deny themselves even though these feelings inside them are raging. And I know that it's not something that God just takes, you know, flips a switch and fixes and takes away, but over the course of our lifetime, we should be moving away from those desires. We should be sanctified and we're, none of us are fully sanctified on this side of the cross. But we should spend our lifetime being obedient in ways that make us more like Christ, that sanctify us, that make us whole through Christ. And so we should be moving away from those desires, from, from those attraction feelings. We should let the Lord untwist what our hearts have twisted. And I see some people say, gosh, now I'm almost out of time. I see some people say, well, it's kind of this false dichotomy they have that, that some people are preaching so strongly with, with uh, so much confidence that, you either embrace these feelings and accept, accept, your identify, accept your identity as gay or you have to hate yourself. Like, those are the two options. It's like, identify this way, embrace it, or hate yourself. Those are not the two options. We can hate our desires, spend our entire life being, being you know, uh, moving away from them and still completely rest in God's grace. Like, that is the journey that all of us should be on, is that no matter where we're at in our faith, no matter what heart-level desires we have, whatever inclination towards any sin, we can rest in God's grace through this process and still be moving away from those desires through our lifetime. Resting in God's grace, yet letting Him change us from the inside out. And that change isn't going to fully happen on this side of the cross. But we still go through that process. So for me, that question of, are we born that gay? Or, excuse me, gosh, it is, I've been up here for too long. I can no longer speak. I think that means we're supposed to be done. It's God's providence that I shouldn't take you over time. Uh, and so it, it's important for the, the fact of sanctification. And then it's also important when I sit down with a guy with same-sex attraction and I explain to him some of this idolatry I've seen in my own heart, and I explain to him, we're usually attracted to other guys who have things that we want. And so in my own life, it looks like, you know, I know when I first came to know Christ and I started to discover some of these things, uh, a guy would walk in my life who, you know, I was so attracted to. I would be, like, obsessed with him. And I go through this process of unpacking, okay, all right, what is my heart actually seeking? Uh, what is my heart looking for? And it was usually he had something that I wanted, something that I was insecure about. Uh, talents and abilities, personality characteristics, uh, and, you know, or— uh, um, physical characteristics. And so I was insecure about this area, and so I would, you know, what I looked like. So I'd be attracted to the guy who has the looks that I wish I had for myself. So this attraction is kind of a way of acquiring that for myself. And so I explained that to a guy, and he's like, no, to 
lots of guys I've had this conversation with, and they're like, no, it can't be that simple. It can't be that easy. And, uh, uh, and it's like, I'm not saying it's easy, but that is probably reality in your heart. And he, he's like, aren't I just born this way? And then he sits there in silence, and I just let him sit there in silence for a few minutes and kind of see some light bulbs going off in his head. And he's like, finally, like, you're so right. It's like, I am attracted to people who have the things that I wish I had for myself. And that starts to give him a tool to, to see this a little more clearly, that maybe I'm not born this way. Maybe this isn't the way it has to be. Maybe this is my heart seeking something that it shouldn't. Maybe it's my heart trying to find wholeness in something that it shouldn't. And maybe I can find that in Christ instead. And so it's a very important conversation uh, for the sake of sanctification, helping people understand what's going on in their heart. All right, we are out of time, and so... Uh, um, we just, uh, I need to let you go. There's still some questions that I have not gotten to. And so um, if, if I, I didn't get to your question, you still have questions, feel free to connect with my ministry. I have some cards back there uh, and some brochures. Feel free to send me an email or something. There's also, if you want to stay in touch with my ministry at all, I send out some, once in a while, uh, email prayer requests on just what I'm doing, what you can be praying for, and also some uh, newsletters. So feel free to sign up back there. I'd love to have you on my list. And uh, you can keep up, and I love your prayers for, for what I do. Um, but why don't we have Barrett come back up and just close us? Maybe you want to close us with a word of prayer, uh, whatever you want to close us with. Pastor Carl might have a word to say, so we can let these guys close it up. Thank you for listening to me this long. Um, I rarely have this length of time to talk to someone, and so, and I got every minute out of it. So I thank you for your quiet attention and being willing to listen for so long. And my voice is definitely giving out, so I think that this is the Lord's providence. Thank you, guys.